Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Cash. I'm a member of the marketing team here at Mounts. I'm glad you've taken the time to join us today and I hope that you get some useful information uh, that you can take along with you and use in your uh, applications as we look at our topic today of how friction impacts torque and the fastening process. So uh, the goal of any type of uh, fastening um, procedure as it relates to torque is we are trying to generate uh, what is called a clamp force. And through the actual torquing of a fastener, we're trying to stretch our uh, fastener to give us that clamp force that is pressing in on the components to keep those together. So it's not necessarily the torque that keeps uh, the parts together, but it is the actual clamp force that holds those together. So that's our end goal is to try to achieve the correct clamp force that we need. And by that means we use torque to do that. Now, torque and friction, uh, they go uh, hand in hand. In fact, you can't have torque without friction. Um, and so there is a relationship that um, the uh, friction and the torque share uh, in a bolted joint assembly. And so if we take a look um, at the uh, actual coefficient of friction, um, which is uh, one of the components that uh, certainly takes place within the torquing process, this is the ratio of the tangential force that's needed to start or maintain uniform relative motion between two contacting surfaces perpendicular to the force holding them in contact. And sometimes it, it may take more force to get that uh, movement started than the actual friction. And so if we look at this graphically, uh, we have our cube here, um, which has uh, the force pressing down on it. Let's call that uh, gravity. And then we have our tangential force that we are going to be moving this block. So as we apply force to that, uh, once we get to a certain uh, threshold, then the uh, block will continue to move in a continuous motion. That would be our coefficient of friction. And so if we look at this graphically, um, as we apply uh, force or load to our cube, we overcome our threshold of motion and then we move into our constant friction state or our coefficient of friction. Now, when you are looking um, at uh, the symbol for the coefficient of friction, it is utilized by the Greek letter mu. So if you see this symbol, uh, we're talking about the coefficient of friction. Now, there are a number of different uh, coefficients of friction dealing with the bolted assembly. So if we take a look at what the actual formula is, uh, when we are looking at uh, the torque in relation to the clamp force, uh, this is the actual uh, formula that we would be dealing with. And so there's quite a lot uh, going on within the coefficient of friction process. So if we, if we break it down, uh, we have the pitch of the threads uh, for that fastener. We also have the coefficient of friction of the threads themselves. We have the coefficient of friction uh, on the bearing surfaces. So that would be the head in contact with the washer and the part. We also have, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, diameter of the threads that we are dealing with, the clearance uh, diameter of the washer and hole, and then the outer diameter of the bearing surface. So all of this together is going to provide us with the uh, coefficient of friction multiplied by our clamp force, this is going to give us what our torque value um, is. Now, um, in an effort to uh, kind of simplify things, um, fastener companies have developed uh, what is called the uh, K-nut factor. And so this is a, uh, a constant that is given to a particular fastener. Uh, but it's not the true coefficient of friction. Um, it is a general purpose constant that is uh, always referred to as a theoretical number. Um, and they were they will always be um, supplied with uh, an asterisk 
that says, um, you know, your results may vary. This is a theoretical number. Please do testing to make sure that uh, you are getting the correct uh, value. So the use of the of the K-nut factor um, helps us to actually uh, reduce the size of the formula that we're dealing with, but it does give us a very good starting point when we are looking to uh, develop a, a torque specification based off of force. And so in this case, we have our clamp force times the diameter multiplied by the K-nut factor. And so if uh, we want to uh, try to um, look at the uh, next component within the, the process, and that's going to be the proof load. Now, the proof load is uh, that within the fastener itself, which is going to be um, the tensile strength um, that's applied during that fastener um, and the what would be... Uh, the amount of force it can handle um, up to a certain point uh, until that fastener would begin to deform. And so this is uh, another component of the fastener uh, specification that is given to us uh, within the uh, literature of the fastener uh, manufacturer. And so what this basically means is that if we have a, uh, a threaded rod um, in this case, we just have a, a standard rod, but as we pull it, we are um, adding load to its tensile strength. And so in a normal fastening situation, if we do uh, provide load on the fastener, um, we take the load off by removing uh, the nut, that fastener should come back to its normal state. Uh, and if we uh, go outside of the proof load, we will hit the yield point uh, and then the fastener will begin to deform. So at this point, uh, we have passed the yield point of our fastener. And um, if we try to take the load off, it will uh, not return back to its uh, normal state. And so obviously, if we keep pulling on it, eventually we are going to have failure. So uh, this graphically looks like this, we get to our yield point um, and everything past that is going to be our plastic region of that particular fastener. Um, and then the proof load usually is uh, anywhere from 85% to 95% of the yield point. Um, and most torque specifications are going to be uh, in the uh, ballpark of around 75% of the yield point. And so <coughs> Pardon me. This is uh, typically uh, what you'll see within the uh, the torque, or excuse me, the uh, proof load specifications uh, on a particular fastener. Now, if you wanted to uh, do some testing in house uh, and look at a joint that you may be having some issues with, you can certainly use a setup like this, where you have a, a rotary torque sensor that's connected to a torque analyzer. Uh, and this sensor goes in between your tool and your part, and you can then take that part to a failure point. Either the fastener breaks or the, uh, the part um, fails. And at that point, you can then look at what that value is, and then you can uh, take a look at uh, if that is within the ballpark of 75% of the yield point um, or the failure. Uh, this it would be a way that you could do that type of testing in-house, again, with the rotary uh, torque sensor. Um, but, <coughs> pardon me, if we uh, want to try to look at developing um, the torque from a, a force perspective, perspective in an engineering type of scenario, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what that might look like as we try to develop what torque we may need for a specific application. And so let's start with the fastener itself. We have a half inch hex cap screw that has 13 threads per inch. It's also zinc plated at grade five. Now we know in our part, we've calculated that we need approximately 9,000 pounds of force to hold our components together. And so using our K nut factor, we can go ahead and develop what our torque specification um, should be. 
And so if we take a look at our force, which we want to be 75% uh, of the proof load, we can multiply that times the uh, proof load of 85,000 PSI uh, multiplied by the tensile stress area at 0.1419 um, squared. And this is going to equal 9,045 pounds of force that is needed for this application. We say great. We then uh, take our uh, K-nut factor of 0.21, uh, and this is going to be a dry fastener. And we multiply that out with our uh, K-nut factor, our diameter, and our force. So 0.21 times a uh, half, which a half inch, um, then multiplied by 9,045. And this is going to give us uh, 950 inch pounds. Um, and if we divide that by 12, we're at roughly 79 foot pounds of torque. So for us to generate 9,000 pounds of force, we need roughly 79 foot pounds of torque. Now, if we do the same exercise with um, everything else being the same, the only difference is we are going to use a lubricated fastener now, which changes our K-nut factor to 0.12. This will change our uh, torque output as well. Uh, so multiplying this out uh, comes to 543 inch-pounds or roughly 45 foot-pounds. So this would be the scenario that you would use if you're using a lubricated half-inch cap screw versus a dry um, half-inch uh, hex cap screw. Now, the real issue uh, and real problem comes with if we are using a lubricated fastener in a dry application and we take that fastener to 950 inch-pounds um, of torque, then we are creating almost 16,000 pounds of force in that same application. And so that is going to yield us with a increase in our clamp force by over 75%. And so with the uh, uh, introduction of just one change to our application, um, we've grabbed a lubricated fastener versus grabbing a dry fastener. We have increased it or increased our clamp force. And now we're putting ourselves in that uh, almost plastic region for this fastener. So any type of shock or vibration is going to uh, damage our uh, particular uh, bolt. So, uh, and then conversely, if we were to use a, uh, a dry fastener in a lubricated setting, then um, we would be decreasing the amount of clamp force that we are given because we're only taking that fastener to uh, 45 um, foot-pounds of torque. So, <coughs> pardon me. When we look at the total uh, torque distribution throughout the rundown process, there are several areas where the torque is being um, consumed um, it's all not just done in the actual clamp force. And so if we have a coefficient of friction of 0 0.08, this is the typical torque distribution that you would see. So 45% of the torque that we're applying goes to overcoming friction uh, on the head and bearing surfaces. Uh, about 35% uh, goes to the thread friction. So as that fastener begins to uh, stretch and we get then 20% of the actual clamp force or the stretch in the fastener as we are uh, trying to overcome the additional friction areas. So uh, what this might look like um, if we increased our coefficient of friction to 0.14, now almost half of the amount of torque that we are supplying is going to overcome the head friction. 39% is has gone to the thread friction and only 12% is now used for the clamp force. So as we change different coefficients of friction, 
different areas within the torque distribution will change as well. And this is really important to, to keep in mind because if we were to take the same uh, values, uh, 49, 39, and 12, <coughs> pardon me, um, and we just remove, uh, let's say 10% to the head friction, um, this can cause uh, a lot of issues as well. And so how could this, this happen? How can we remove just the, uh, 10% uh, that's going into the head friction? Well, it could be as simple as the operator uh, did not put a washer in the assembly. And this is going to change uh, the coefficient of friction. It could be that the operator grabbed the wrong washer uh, and it may have a different material coating to it than the uh, standard washer that was um, specified. And so this could uh, change the, the coefficient of friction. Uh, it could be that uh, we ran out of a certain uh, washer, but we have the same one, but it is um, a different size. So uh, we've used that uh, a smaller um, washer than normal. That's going to change um, the coefficient of friction uh, as it relates to the head bearing surface. So it doesn't take uh, very much uh, to be able to uh, do this. And so this is going to change um, our uh, overall coefficient of friction to 0.126. And now what is done, it has um, increased our clamp force from 12% uh, all the way to 18% just by that 10% uh, reduction in the head friction. And with that, that's going to increase our clamp force again by 50% um, on our stretch that we're getting within our fastener. Now, conversely, again, if we go the other direction, we're going to give not as much uh, stress or stretch or clamp force within our fastener. And so we could see failure um, on the uh, increase of clamp force and we may see failure on the decrease of clamp force because any vibration um, or movement with any of those scenarios, and we may see failure in the fastener. So it's good to, to keep in mind that um, there are a number of different influencers that can play a part in changing the coefficient of friction. Um, one that we've certainly touched on here is going to be the lubrication. So if we add lubrication to any, any area within the fastening process, that is going to decrease our coefficient of friction. Uh, if there are changes in any of the coating surfaces uh, that the <coughs> excuse me that the uh, components have been specced at, and if there are changes to that, that again is going to affect the coefficient of friction. It may decrease it. It may increase it. Um, tightening speed can also play uh, a factor in the coefficient of friction um, if the speed changes the temperature at all, uh, that can increase or decrease the coefficient of friction. Um, different types of materials will react differently uh, when under load against each other. So that may play a, a portion. Um, the geometry, if we increase or decrease uh, washers, that can also uh, change our coefficient of friction as well as hardness materials. Uh, changes to that as well. One item that is uh, on not on here, um, but can also uh, play a big part in um, what would be considered almost a lubrication state would be the use of a thread locker within um, a specification that may have been originally spec'd as a dry uh, type of scenario, where if we're adding that as a liquid, that liquid then can add as a, a lubricant, again, providing us with a lower coefficient of friction and maybe adding more clamp force to our fastener. Um, another one may be the use of a, uh, a nylon lock uh, washer, or excuse me, a nylon uh, nut. Uh, and this is actually introducing more uh, friction in the thread surfaces uh, as we are running that fastener down, it may be um, adding a prevailing torque. And now we've increased the friction in the thread surfaces. 
and we may be decreasing the amount of clamp force that we may be getting in the actual uh, part itself. And so um, all of this to kind of bring it all together, anytime there is a change to the um, application, um, whether it be the change of materials, uh, the change of a new vendor for those materials, um, you want to make sure and do some testing um, that uh, ensures that you are getting the correct clamp force that you are looking for uh, for that particular um, application. Because with a, uh, a vendor change on a fastener, this vendor may not do a, a, as well of a job as deburring those fasteners. And that can um, increase the coefficient of friction and change the clamp load that you are getting. Um, so again, anytime that there is a change in um, the process uh, or your materials, it is always a good idea to take a look and do some testing to make sure that that application is performing the way that you would like it to do. And with that, that's going to leave us lead us to the end of today's presentation. I need to get a drink of water. And so, uh, Chris, do we have any questions? Morning, Dave. Thanks. Uh, first question that we have is, is there any benefit of measuring torque? I mean, is there any benefit of measuring angle while measuring torque? So uh, there is, um, especially if you're having um, a scenario where you may be uh, looking at um, the introduction of lubrication to a fastener by accident or um, in a scenario where there may be uh, one part used and another part used, you can use what is called a, a torque and angle type of specification. And what this does is um, it kind of uh, removes the frictional forces um, as it, the fastener gets uh, tightened. So the typical uh, specification would be you run that fastener till it seats. Um, and then at that particular uh, torque value, uh, that's where you stop measuring torque and you start measuring the amount of turn in that, uh, in that nut, for example. Uh, and then this, the amount of turn that happens is always going to provide us with the same amount of stretch in that fastener. And so uh, this would be a good type of uh, specification where, for example, you would run a fastener to say 100 newton meters. That is going to seat the fastener and then we rotate it uh, 40 degrees or so. Uh, this may then give us a final torque in the ballpark of around 500 newton meters. But even if there was, uh, let's say, lubrication introduced to this fastener, um, that lubrication may change the coefficient of friction, but it doesn't change how far we turn that, that nut. So the, the final torque may be a lot lower, uh, but the same stretch happens within that fastener. So that would be the use of a torque plus angle type of tightening strategy. All right, Dave. Uh, the next question we had was, is there a process or a guide to help determine a torque spec for a fastener on an application? <coughs> So you may see um, scenarios where you're given a, a fastener and uh, it is then given a, a recommended torque value. Uh, but again, as we demonstrated in our exercise uh, in developing a torque specification based off of our clamp load, you can use that uh, scenario where you take your, your part and, and you do some testing with a, uh, a sensor and you go ahead and take that part to failure um, and you can see what that failure uh, torque is. And at that point, you could back it off by 75%. And that would be a good place to start. Uh, again, do more testing uh, and dial that in to make sure that that is going to be uh, the correct torque specification. But that is typically how you can do that um, within the uh, process, um, especially if you're having issues with a particular joint as well. All right, Dave, that looks like that's the end of our questions for today. All right. I want to say thanks very much for joining us. Uh, and we look forward 
to uh, having you join us next month for our topic on calibrating uh, torque sensors. So with that, have a great day and we'll see you next time.